All right. Welcome back. So uh, your usual reminders are up here. Uh, for those of you who have not seen the email, I did set up your review for test three. It is in my math lab. So I know test one and test two, I put a document in Canvas. I wanted to do this one a little differently since the problems are a little more advanced. Uh, so I set up an actual air quote graded assignment in my math lab, but it's not going to be graded. The grade will be omitted. Again, reviews are not going to count towards uh, your homework grade, test grade, or anything like that. The review is just for your sake. Please complete the reviews. Uh, just like previously, the review questions and the test questions will bear strong similarities to each other. <laughs> so test three will start this Thursday. We will finish the material for this test today. Uh, in about, I don't know, 20 minutes roughly, maybe 25 minutes. And you have the review available, so you're able to start it as early as Thursday. Uh, the last day you have is Monday the 4th, and you have to have that in before midnight. You get two attempts. I had said previously that there might be a pen and paper portion for this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it for now. I was able to find questions in my math lab that I think are good enough uh, detailed enough, you know, the ones where I would want you to be graphing by hand, uh, those questions ask you for the intercepts and they ask you for this and they ask you for that and they ask you to click the points to make the graph and everything. So I'm good. I think I'm happy with that. So I'm going to avoid it for now, but the final exam, I really, really do want to have at least a small portion that is paper pencil. So again, I'm going to throw this statement now that there's likely a paper pencil portion that'll be uploaded to Canvas. Uh, the final will be Thursday the 7th. It'll begin at midnight. It's due by midnight before, or you know, 11.59 p.m. the same day. There will only be one attempt for the final exam. So make sure that you're going ahead and looking back over your previous tests. Uh, the final will be very similar to test one through three questions plus some stuff from chapter four, five, or whatever it is. Is it four? It's four. Yes, four. Um, 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 the final maybe 20 to 25 questions, the regular test generally 20. Final maybe a couple more. Uh, the time will be proportional to how much time you need. Yes, it is a time test. No, I will not make an untimed final exam. Those don't exist in the world of math. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then grades will be in uh, roughly, you know, roughly 24 hours after. It may be as late as Monday because of all the unique things going on like the fact that some of you will get A, B, C grades, some of you will get uh, a W or a P plus or a P minus grades. Uh, I have sent an email out yesterday about how you all should all have already received emails. That sucks. Um, sorry, not, nothing for y'all. Um, something I need to, t to get someone to help me out with real quick. Uh, something related to our, uh, our class later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Anyways, where was I? I just got completely distracted. Talking about the final, oh, the grading scale. So make sure that you are submitting what style grade you want. Uh, there's a link that you've been emailed. Uh, I told you what that link title was. And I can't remember these things off the top of my head, but it's something like, you know, uh, grade choice for the semester, blah, blah, blah. So I am not going to just say, oh, okay, a student emailed me, so that's what I'm gonna give them, the A or the P plus you need to submit that form. I'm only gonna take information from that form. Uh, I have not been told officially in writing what y'all's last day to submit that form is. I believe, I heard word of mouth that it was the seventh, our last day of class, but that's word of mouth, so I am not going to say definitively that that's what it is. Please do not wait until the last day to do that. In my opinion, that is a terrible idea. Um, once you have your first three tests graded and everything, uh, you know how much homework you're doing, you should be able to add up your homework grades, divide by the number of homework grades to get your average, all that stuff. So you should be able to have a good idea of whether you want your A, B, or C, or you know, if you think you just need to take the W, then you can take the W. Remember, everyone automatically defaults 
to the P plus, P minus, or W grade. If you want to keep your A, B, C, D grade, then you have to make the request. So if I don't see the request that I'll get <laughs> through some document later, uh, if I don't see your name on that list, then you just get a P plus, a P minus, or a W. All right, so let's not waste any more time on the semantics. Why is this not, there we go. And let's get into our last section, 3.7, modeling using variation. So we're going to take a very, very quick approach at this uh, with just a couple of examples, and then we're gonna move on to chapter four. I've gotta make sure that we get some chapter four stuff done in this course. That way you're ready for it. You've seen it before at least uh, when you might see it in chemistry or calc two or calc one or pre-calc two even. So variation has a few, I don't wanna say a few, there are lots of different types of variation. You have direct variation, you have indirect variation, also known as inverse variation. And then you have the infinitely many other options of varying directly with the square of something or varying inversely with the cube root of something or varying jointly with apples and oranges. You can actually vary uh, directly, indirectly to more than just one input variable, in fact. So variation starts out as an introduction is the idea of proportionality. So direct variation is the same thing as proportional. And I even have that right here. If y varies directly with x, then y is proportional to x. Proportionality is an amazingly useful thing in the real world of math, uh, just for describing lots of models to, again, simple things. Like uh, the number of tickets you buy should be varying directly, aka proportional, to the cost, the total cost, since tickets usually cost the same per. Unless you live in a real world where the first ticket's more expensive than the second ticket. No matter. <clears throat> All direct variation can be modeled as this type of equation. It's a quite simple equation, probably the simplest equation we do all semester, y equals kx, where k is a number. We give it a special name, the constant of proportionality, k for constant, ha ha ha. <laughs> so k is just gonna end up being a number, y equals 3x, y equals 5x, y equals negative 17x, y equals 1 half x. Those would all be direct variation problems. And that constant basically gives you a direct relationship choice of words was intentional there, uh, between how many apples leads to how many oranges. So if you said that the number of oranges uh, varies directly with apples, and that when you sell one apple, there's two oranges, that says if you sell two apples, there'd be four oranges, or six apples would be 12 oranges. You just double one. In other words, the K would be two. But we can also modify direct variation by saying y varies directly with the square of x, so that would give us y equals kx squared. Or we could even say y varies directly with the cube root of x. And that would be y equals k times the cube root of x. Now that three is going with the root, not the k. Let me give myself just a little more space so you don't accidentally think that. So again, you don't really want that much space there. I'm just trying to be emphatic here that the three is a cube root, not a cube on the k. You're not going to give the k's exponents. They're just numbers. There's no exponents. There's no funny business that associates with them. So how are we gonna actually process these problems? Well, for these problems, you must first find the constant of proportionality by plugging in a pair of X or Y values. They're not always written in X and Y. You can use any letters you like. If you're talking about, say, velocity and distance, you could use letters like V and D. If you're talking apples and oranges, you could, letters like, you could use letters like A and O if you really wanna be uh, silly. O for oranges, kinda looks like a zero though, not my favorite letter, maybe R instead oranges. <laughs> so you can find the k as long as you have a pair of values, as long as you have an x associated with a y, an apple associated with an orange, or if you're dealing with multiple variables, an x, a y, and a z, like the joint variation, 
uh, then you'd have to have a number for all of those. <clears throat> once you have your K, you plug it in. So once you know your K, you'll actually plug it in. So instead of writing Y equals KX, you'll write Y equals 5X, or Y equals 7X, or Y equals negative 1 half X. And that K will stay the same for that problem until you start talking about a different set of parameters. <clears throat> then you'll have another X or a Y, and it doesn't have to be an X. It could be a Y because we know how to solve equations. You could plug that value in, and then you can find your unknown, like in this example that you see at the bottom of the screen. And I have some stuff that you don't necessarily need to see. I can write that out. Uh, pause here. Okay. So a source, a store notices that the apples and oranges it sells vary directly. So the number of apples varies directly with the number of oranges. Or you could say the number of oranges varies directly with the number of apples. Direct variation, you can interchange them. You can't do that with joint variation or with varying with a square or cube root of something like that. So on Monday, the store sold 10 apples and 40 oranges. On Tuesday, the store sold 50 apples. How many oranges were sold that day? So I think it's a really good idea to set up labels for what's what. So we're going to say that the number of apples varies directly with the number of oranges. Let's call the oranges are x. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't really matter. I wanna call the apples the X there just to make the numbers easier. So we'll call the number of apples X and the number of oranges Y. So that gives us the equation Y equals KX because they told us that the apples and oranges vary directly. I could have also said they were proportional. That would mean the same thing. So on Monday, the store sold 10 apples. So that's our X and it sold 40 oranges. So that's our Y. So what we can do from here, this is just saying, <laughs> we're changing this Y equals KX to uh, 40 equals K times 10, which is a very simple equation to solve. All you gotta do is divide both sides by 10. And that tells us that four is equal to K. This is our constant of proportionality. It says for every one of one of the things, four of the other things is sold. Again, for every one in one thing, it's four in the other. Now, since the X is on the right-hand side with the K, that's where we plug the apples in. That says for every one apple, we're selling four oranges, and that makes sense because 10 leads to 40. So now what we do is we're gonna rewrite the original equation. Instead of writing y equals kx, we're gonna write y equals 4x. Because k is four for now and forever until we get a new problem. So what do we do next? Well, we go to Tuesday. On Tuesday, the store sold 50 apples. How many oranges were sold? So we know the store sold 50 apples and there's this proportional relationship uh, between them. So the oranges should sell. So basically they're just thinking foot traffic is increasing. So if one thing sells more then the other thing's gonna sell more. So X was again, the number of apples. This is why we labeled things, it's very helpful. So we get Y equals four times 50. So Y is equal to 200. Y is apples, I'm sorry, Y is oranges. So that's our answer. <clears throat> There's no graphing of rationals. There's no asymptotes. There's no possible rational zeros. This is very basic algebra that I teach to my developmental students. Just this type of problem though. The joint variation, the inverse variation, that's a little tougher, but not nearly as, as tough as you might think. So that was part A. <clears throat> um, I must have arranged a, I mean, I must have erased part B. That's okay. B, we can do this on the fly. <clears throat> on Wednesday, the store sold, um, how many do we want to do? Let's go with five oranges. 
No, we'll do eight oranges. How many apples? So on Wednesday, foot traffic was down. They only sold eight oranges. Or maybe it's just because the oranges were ugly and maybe there isn't really this direct relationship between the two. But again, I'm talking semantics, not the actual problem at hand. So we still have that y is equal to 4x. This part, again, doesn't change in the context of the same example. But now the eight that was oranges, that's a y value. So we're plugging it in on the left side. So what we get is, 8 equals 4x. So we're going to divide both sides by 4. And that gives us the very, I hope, obvious answer that two apples is our x. Direct variation means that as one increases, the other increases. More specifically, if one doubles, the other doubles. Or if one goes up by a factor of 10, the other goes up by a factor of 10. Inverse variation is quite the opposite. It means as one increases, the other decreases. But it's not a linear relationship. It's actually this y equals k over x. It's a reciprocal relationship. This is when we had our first graph, a y equals 1 over x of, with asymptotes. So it's not just like if one thing doubles, uh, or if one thing goes up two, the other thing goes down two. It's if one thing doubles, the other halves. Or if one thing goes up by uh, a factor of four, the other goes down by a factor of a fourth. And that's because the x is in the bottom, which means as one goes up, the other goes down. We saw that when we were doing our table of values with this type of function right here. Again, the reciprocal function. So the math still works the same. You set up your y equals k over x. You plug in an x and a y, you solve for the k. You rewrite your model, and then you go back and plug in another x or y. All right, so again, we got some extra stuff in here that you don't necessarily need to see. I'm going to skip uh, pausing my screen, though. There we go. The amount of charge in a capacitor varies inversely with time. So this is very true, and I'd love to go on a nice long rant about how capacitors work. Unfortunately, we are low on time. <laughs> So the amount of charge in a capacitor varies inversely with time. The only thing I'll say is, you know when they tell you to unplug your modem for 30 seconds and wait, it has to do with this because capacitors hold a charge and after 30 seconds for most of our technology, that charge is gone and everything actually resets. It may be 10 seconds, it may be 12 seconds, but 30 guarantees it. So after two seconds, the amount of charge in the capacitor is 10 farads. Don't worry about what a farad is. You can call it a ferret if you want to have fun with it. We're not worried about what actual units mean here. What will the charge be after 30 seconds? So the amount of charge in a capacitor varies inversely with time. So the amount of charge, especially when it's not a direct variation, you want to be a little more careful about how you set up the equation. The thing that blah, 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 blah varies, this is what should be by itself. So let's call this right here the y. So I'm going to call the amount of charge in the capacitor y, and this is going to vary inversely with time, and we'll call the time x. So again, y is the charge. X will be time. Please feel, used, uh, please feel free to use letters like c and t if you prefer. No one's going to care. Uh, and it varies inversely, so we set up the model y equals k over x. It's a very simple thing to have to memorize because it varies inversely. It's k over x instead of k times x. Then they tell us after two seconds, there are 10 things of charge in the capacitor, 10 ferrets or farads. Those are the numbers that go together. So we plug them in for the y and the x and make sure you're plugging them into the right spots. So two seconds, that's a time, that's our x. So we go, we should have our highlighter off, right? equals k over 2, and then the y, that's the charge in the capacitor, that's the 10. So we get 10 equals k over 2. We got to solve for k, very easy to do, multiply both sides by 2. If you forget that, please go solve 100 of these before the next class, and thank you. So the 2's cancel, and you get 20 equals k. So now we can rewrite our model, our equation, as y equals 2 over x, 20 over x, excuse me. I was looking at the 2, pardon my 
typo. K was 20. It's 20 over X. <clears throat> So this is our model. Now, no matter what our x's or y is, are going to be, which they can vary, <laughs> the k is always 10. It's constant. Sorry, 20. It's always constant. I got to stop looking at other numbers. So next up, they say, what will the charge be after 30 seconds? The charge is 30 seconds. Is that the y? No, that's the x. The time is 30 seconds. That's our x. So this is a t or an x, depending on what your letter choice is. So now what we do is we plug 30 in for x, so we get y equals 20 over 30, which reduces to 2 thirds. The units for charge would, would be farads. And that's our answer. Farads. So again, inverse relationships means as, mean as one goes up, the other goes down. We went from two seconds to 30 seconds, so time went up. The charge went from 10 to two thirds, that went down. Now, these rational relationships, we saw that a lot of them have those horizontal asymptotes. They could be constant if the ratio uh, if the degrees were the same in the top and bottom, then you take the ratio of the leading coefficients. We said that it would go to zero if there were a higher power in the bottom, which is the case here. This is an x to the first. There's no x's in the top. So this thing should go to zero as time moves on. So we got all that. Let's do this. B. At what time? Will there be a 0.1 farad charge? So maybe your <laughs> uh, internet device just needs enough time until we hit that. So 30 seconds was two thirds of a farad. And I mean, like I said, these numbers are kind of just makeshift, but maybe we have a super, super sensitive piece of technology and we need this thing to get down to 0.1 farads before we replug it or you know, whatever the application is. So we're still using y equals 20 over x. But this 0.1 charge, that's not a time. Remember, x was time, y is the charge. This is a y value. So we plug the 0.1 into the left, and we get 20 over x. Well, this is, an, uh, this is a rational equation, so we have to clear the fractions. So we find an LCD. It's the only thing we see in a de denominator, which is x. And then we multiply both sides by that. Doesn't matter if the X goes in the front or the back of a term, as long as it's not in the bottom. So those are gone. So now what we get is 0.1 X is equal to 20. Now you are allowed calculators at this point. So if you just wanted to divide by 0.1 and make me not happy, you can. But you can also go the extra mile and clear the decimal. You can multiply both sides by 10. So we go 10 times the left, 10 times the right. This is if you wanted to clear the decimals, if you don't know how to divide by decimals, or if you're not using a calculator, like I really don't think you need. So you get 10 times 0.1 is one. So the left side is just X. The right side would be 200. And this would be 200 seconds. So again, maybe you've just got some super sensitive piece of electronic equipment and uh, all these parameters are realistic. Again, we're faking that. And you gotta wait 200 seconds or three minutes and 20 seconds for it to actually discharge enough for you to replug it in. There are devices like that. Um, and again, I'm gonna skip anything that's actually relative because I have a little five minute rant I'd love to do, but I'm gonna skip it. Uh, I'm also gonna skip the next example, which is a, a fun one. Uh, dealing with CEO salary, which is super relevant right now while we're all laid off or not getting raises and all those CEOs are going to give themselves big old uh, bonus packages for weathering the coronavirus storm after their company survives, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the last thing I want to mention is joint variation. And I don't think I had that typed up, did I? Did not, good. I'll leave this on screen in case anyone wants to pause it for about five seconds. So again, if you're really interested, this is a fun little variation that varies with the square of something. So a CEO's salary varies, varies directly with the square of the number of employees in a company. So you have to write Y equals KX squared, where Y is the salary and X is the employees. 
you cannot swap salary and employees in this model. You can with direct variation without the extra complication of with the square. You actually can also with inverse variation, but you can't when you have a square or a square root or a cube or a cube root or anything extra like this. So the thing that's on the left, the salary, the thing that's varying with blah, 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 has to go on the left of the equation that's important. So we had 200 employees and the CEO made 40 million. So here's you plugging in the 200, you square it to get the 40,000, plug in the 40 million, we divide by that number to get K as 1,000. We rewrite our model. Then we're uh, asked to say, all right, well, how much did the CEO make if we half the number of employees? What's the effect on their salary? Well, it turns out they go down to a million. So it's actually a pretty big effect. Uh, that should be 10 million, actually. I'm missing a zero. I think I must have. Done something wrong there. There we go. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. I don't know why I had that typo because I knew it was 10 million. So this is how you'd set up varying with a square of something. So the last thing I wanted to mention was joint variation. Something like, uh, let's say Z varies. Uh, directly with X and inversely with the square of Y. I'm not gonna do any numbers, I'm just gonna show you what the setup would look like. Joint variation means you've got multiple variables on the other side. So I've got Z as the thing varying with blah, 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 blah. So this has to go on the left. Z has to go on the left because that's the thing varying blah, 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 blah. Then we go equals. It's varying, so there's a K up there somewhere. And the K always goes in the top. Directly with the X, so that would put an X in the top. Inversely with the Y, so that puts it in the bottom. And is this right? No, it's not actually, because it's not varying inversely with Y. It's varying inversely with the square of Y. So it's not just a Y in the bottom, it's a Y squared. Make sure that you're paying attention to all the little details. One of my favorite test questions in the past, not necessarily doing it this year, uh, involved in inverse uh, variation of a square, something having to do with gravity. And uh, historically, a lot of people would forget the square part. So again, there's really nothing super technical in this section. It, there's no new algebra. There is literally no new algebra. If you see any new algebra up here, please let me know because I'll point you to where we did it previously or where you would have done it in a developmental math class, math class before me. The only thing that I introduced was how to set up the equation. So direct variation, y equals kx. Inverse variation, y equals k over x. You might have some extra words, which just gives you an x squared or a square root. If I said varies inversely with the square root of x, that would be k over x squared. I can't give you every single option available because there's infinitely many options. All right, um, I'm going to need a couple of minutes to get this next thing set up because there's a complication. Uh, give me 75 seconds, I think. I can knock this out. All right, not as long as I thought it would be. So let me do a new page. I realized, uh, a portion of my notes were missing, but I have them all available electronically. I just can't have them on the screen and teach at the same time. So I'm borrowing a laptop and needed a password. <laughs> Fun stuff. All right, so 4.1, exponential functions. 
So I'm actually going to mention something that I didn't used to always mention in a pre-calc class that a lot of teachers don't in fact, but exponential functions operate under a basic principle. And that is that you have a constant percent growth each interval. So this could be something like you're gaining money 5% every year. But you don't just gain money on your initial balance when you go to year two, you're gaining money on the balance of year one. When you go to year three, you're gaining uh, money on the balance of year one and two, plus all the interest that you've accrued. Something known as compound interest that we won't have the time to really get into in here, unfortunately, um, but that's okay. But it just means the basic idea of exponential functions before you start manipulating them over and over and over is that you have constant percent change over each time interval or whatever you're talking about if it's not time. They have a pretty standard form. They are the basic form. Let's go f of x is equal b to the x, where b is a number and it has to be positive, but it also cannot be one. Cannot be one. I don't know why I didn't get my not equals at first. B to the X, where the B has to be positive and it can't be one. We call the B the base and the X is the exponent. You might say, well, Mr. Beckner, we've been dealing with these for half the semester. I've seen things that look just like this half the semester. This isn't new. Yes, it is. It looks similar, but it's quite different. The things that we've mainly been dealing with so far have been polynomials. So as a reminder, polynomial terms are more like an X to the B, where the base is allowed to vary, to vary but the exponent is constant. Whereas an exponential is the exact opposite of that, where the base is the constant and the exponent is allowed to vary. So here, this base varies and the exponent is constant, whereas vice versa is the true for exponentials. Okay, so what do we typically like to do when we get a new function? We like a picture of it. When we started dealing with rationals, we wanted a graph of that function. When we started dealing uh, more heavy handed with polynomials, we mainly wanted graphs of them. When we got more heavy handed in quadratics, we wanted graphs of them. I'm working backwards. So let's get a basic graph. Why did it do that? I clicked black, I thought, maybe I didn't. Example one, graph using several points. And we're gonna do for A, f of x is equal to two to the x. So this function right here, there's a classic um, problem. Uh, I'm trying to think of the fancier term for it, but I'm not going to think of it, so I don't want to waste time. Uh, you get paid a penny the first day of work, and then you get paid a pen, uh, two pennies the second day of work, and then you get paid four pennies the next day of work, and you get paid eight pennies the next day of work. And you do this for a month, and the ultimate question is, should you take the job or not, yes or no? And almost everyone, without thinking about this too in depth, says no at first. No, I don't want to make a penny the first day and then two pennies the second day, and then three pennies the third day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out that on that 30th day, because you keep doubling, you go from one penny to, to two pennies, to four, to eight, to 16, to 32 pennies. To six, hold on, let me count these off. 64 would be the sixth day. You're making a buck 28 on the seventh day. You're making 256 on the third day. You're making 512 on, I just lost count. Uh, 64 was six. 120, uh, 128 is seven, 256 is eight, 512 is nine. 
then you're making $10.24 on the 10th day. So you've gone from a penny to 10 bucks in just 10 days. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast growth. I'm, uh, you're not going to see that kind of salary raise as a government employee. Let me tell you that much, at least. No one's ever going to see that. So after 10 days, you went from a penny to 10 bucks. Let's just call it 10 bucks for the sake of easiness. So day 11, you're making 20. Day 12, you're making 40. Day 13, you're making 80. Day 14, you're making 160. Then you're 320 the next day. Then you're uh, 640 the day after. Let's just round down to 500. Then you're making 1,000 the day after. Then you're making 2,000 the day after. And on that 30th day, you're making a significant amount of money. And I'm going to leave that as an exercise for y'all to figure out uh, if you'd like to. So that is exactly how this graph is basically growing. This right here is going to relate to that. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it's going to relate to it. So for our table of values, and with the funkier <laughs> functions, uh, you got to just kind of, you know, sometimes you don't just go negative three to three. Like when we did the rational, we went like negative 100, then negative 10, then negative one, negative a tenth, negative a hundredth, and zero, and then the same positive values. But this one's okay. So let's go from negative three to positive three. And obviously, you wouldn't know to do that on the fly. This is something that's been, you know, done ahead because someone else has studied them and said, this is a good idea as a starting point. Then we will look at the shape, memorize the shape, learn how to do it without a table of values, just with like a one or two point approach and understand its char characteristics so that we don't have to do as much time spending with this. So to the side, let's go two to the negative three. How do we handle negative exponents? We reciprocal them. That's one over two and you change the sign of the exponent. So that's one over two cubed which is one over eight. If you forgot that, go back and do a hundred of them. So when you plug in negative three, you get one eighth. I'm gonna write this slanted due to space. When you plug in negative two, that's two to the negative two, which is one over two squared, which is one fourth. So these are pretty small values. We plug in the negative one. That's one over two to the positive first, which is a half. When you plug in zero, that's two to the zero, which anything to the zero is one. If you forgot that, go back and do a hundred of them. Two to the first is two, two to the second is four, and two to the third is eight. It got easy, so I just went ahead and knocked those out. Two, four, eight. If you actually look at the Y values, you can see that doubling idea I mentioned with the pay to penny the day one, two the day two, three on day three, sorry, four on day three eight on day four, et cetera. Now, we don't have negative days. I didn't go into that context of the problem. So it's like where I have zero here, this is like the first day. So time zero or day zero, we make a penny. Day one, we make two pennies. Day two, we make four pennies. Day three, which is really our fourth work day, making eight pennies. So if we go and do the graph of this, we're gonna need more of a positive side. I don't see any negative Y values, so I don't really need to have much space down here. So we're going from negative three to positive three on the X axis. The Y axis, we've got some fractions, which I'm not really, really label. Just try and space this decently. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm just going to label one, two, four, and eight. So negative three comma one eighth. That's, and we'll do this in red. Left three up just barely, just barely off that axis. We've seen a decent amount of that kind of thing happening in the last chapter. I won't say a decent amount since we only spent a day on it, but we saw it. <laughs> negative two comma one fourth. That's left, left two and up a quarter. So up twice as much, but still not very far off the axis. Negative one comma a half. That's left one and up a half. Zero, one, left or right, zero and up one. One comma two, that's right one up two. Two comma four, that's right two up four. Three comma eight, that's right three and up eight. And if you connect these in a smooth fashion, like you do with curves, with nonlinear functions, you can see that it's getting steeper on the right and it's getting flatter on the left. 
Uh, I missed that dot just a little, but don't worry about it, please. Now, if you keep going left, if you go to negative four, it would be one sixteenth. If you go to negative five, it would be one thirty second. If you don't believe me, just look at the patterns. I think it's obvious if you look at these numbers going down, going from one to two to four to eight, that's doubling each time. So if you start backwards, eight to four to two to one, that's halving each time. So this thing has that asymptote feature. It flattens out. It's never actually gonna hit zero. If you plugged in X equals one million, this would be one divided by two to the one million, which is one divided by some ginormous number, which is pretty much zero as far as we're concerned, but it's still not zero. But on the right, it's gonna keep getting steeper and steeper because we're gonna go to 16, 32, 64. Each next point, just one unit over, is twice as high as the previous one. These are one of the fastest growing functions in existence. Now, you can modify other functions to make them grow faster, <clears throat> but as a base function, this is one of the, I would say, three quickest functions that grow. Factorials are one of the only ones that are quicker than that, um, if you've ever heard of a factorial. It's that exclamation mark. And that's because you keep multiplying by bigger numbers. This, you keep multiplying by two. Factorials, you would then multiply by three, then four, then five, then six, then seven. So what I want you to take away from this is a single point, and that is the 0, 1, <clears throat> which is right here. The fact that it starts growing quicker and quicker and quicker quite rapidly on the right, it kind of looks like a quadratic on the right, in fact, or just the right side of a polynomial. And then the left side is very different. It looks like part of a rational because it flattens out. That's actually an asymptote. And we're going to put a summary together after the next example. All right, so let's flip this idea around. Let's do f of x is equal to 1 half raised to the x. And I want to make a comment here. This is not a times, this is a comment, this is a note. 1 half in parentheses raised to the x is the same thing as 2 raised to the negative x. If you don't believe me, Simplify the left side, simplify the right side. They are the same thing, as long as that numerator is a one inside the parentheses, because this would tell you to flip it so the two to the x goes in the bottom and there'd be a one in the top. If you were to distribute out the x on the left side, one to the x is one. So please note, these are the same thing. So let's again do our table of values. Let's go from negative three to three again. I'm not going to show all the work this time. I'll show the first couple. f of negative 3 is 1 half raised to the negative 3. Having a fraction to a negative exponent says flip the fraction. So that's 2 over 1 raised to the positive 3, which is just 2 to the third, which is 8. Well, that's a familiar looking number. It was the last one previously. If you do f of negative 2, that's going to be 1 half raised to the negative second, which is 2 over 1 raised to the positive second, which is 2 squared, which is 4. Now, let's use our power of observation. Last time, the base was a 2. Last time, that constant, the base was a 2, and every time, it doubled. Double an eighth, you get a quarter. Double a quarter, you get a half. Double a half, you get a whole. Double one, you get two. Double, you get four. Double, you get eight. Double, you get 16. This time, the base is a half. And look at this, we went from eight to four. So I'm willing to bet you $10 million right now that the next answer is two. I bet the next one is half of the previous one. F of negative one, well, that's a half, raised to the negative one, which would be two over one raised to the positive one, which is just two. Oh no. That wasn't for y'all. So I'm not going to skip plugging in any of the other numbers and just go with this principle. The next one is always half. So half of two is one. Half of one is a half. Half of a half is a fourth. Half of a fourth is a sixteenth. And we could keep going to 132nd, 164th, 1 128th. It wouldn't matter. Sorry about that. Thank you. and we don't want to do it that way. We still need just the top part. 
sorry, it's getting something situated. So just the top part of the graph once again. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then heights from one to eight. So here's our eight, here's our four, here's our two, and here's our one. Uh, I doubt it. I doubt that we'll be able to cover all of chapter four. <laughs> I'm going to do my best, but I extremely doubt it. I'm going to cover what you absolutely need to see, though. So negative three comma eight, that's left three up eight. So that's over here. Oops, we want red. Uh, then negative two, four, that's left two up four. Negative one up two, left one up two, zero one, one comma a half, one comma a quarter, one comma an eighth. It's got that same kind of pattern. In fact, the Y values are just flip flop from the last one. So when we connect them, extend them, we see that if you're if you consider yourself moving left, then the growth feels like it's on the left side and it's flattening out, it's flattening out, it's flattening out, it's flattening out. And then it starts getting really, really flat. Emphasize those points a little more. Flattens out and then it has that asymptote feature again, because you're going to go to 132nd, 164th, 132nd. Sorry, uh, 164th and 128th. Of course, our arrow on the top left. So this gives us our two basic graphs. These are the only two graphs we need for the chapter for exponential functions. There are graphs for what we call logarithmic functions as well. Um, and we'll see them, but I'm not really gonna deal with them too much in depth. So again, if I ask you to graph a function like this on a homework or a test, unless it asks you for several points, this is not the way I want you to do it. What I want you to do is take away that zero comma one point, understand that there's this, what I call growth moving left and decay moving right, or in the top one, decay on the left and growth on the right. So let's insert a blank page. There we go, let me go ahead and hit enter. Where did everything go? Oh no, word's about to crash, isn't it? Yep. All right, it's always a joy in technology land. Well, it'll let me write for that right now. So let's see how much it'll let me do. Oh, actually I can't switch my pen. You just gotta let it finish crashing. Maybe. Come on, crash, please. I don't think I've ever said that in my life. Sorry, everyone. And I'm terrified to control alt delete because the last time I did that, it actually killed my recording, I, I believe. I'm fairly certain that's what happened. And I had to re-record an entire class. Uh, it wasn't y'all's, it was my quantitative reasoning class. It's not happy about that. Please. All right, hang tight, hang tight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something. All right, hopefully this stays. 
And wow, it did not even save the last bit. Okay, well, you saw it. You saw it. You go back to YouTube if you still need to see that in the notes. I'm very sorry for that. I wish we were just in person and the board certainly couldn't be magically erased. So what do I want you to take away? If your base is positive and bigger than one, if your base is bigger than one, so a two, a four, an eight, a 16, whatever, even a 1.1, this is known as exponential growth. So all I really need to see is this point right here at a zero comma one, then we have that quick growth on the right. You know, maybe not that quick, but that's good enough. And then the flattening out on the left side. So that's what I would expect. You have a horizontal asymptote. Now, some teachers will draw this all the way across. I only draw it on the left side to emphasize that it's only on one side. So there is a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero on the left only. The left only. Whereas, um, let me put that B somewhere else, eraser. I want that space right there. So when your B is bigger than one, there we go. When your base is between zero and one, and you have the same F of X equals B to the X, it's the same thing, it's just your base is like a half or a third or two ninths. You still get that zero comma one point. But everything is flip-flopped. In fact, it is a reflection about the X and Y axis in comparison to the other one. You see that growth on the left and the decaying or flattening out on the right. So that one has a horizontal asymptote. It's still Y equals zero but on the right side only. Again, some teachers, some technological programs will draw it all the way across. There's nothing wrong drawing it all the way across. For me, I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that we only asymptote on one side. That is vastly different from rational functions. I've mentioned in the last class that rational functions asymptote on both the left and the right side, if there is one. Exponential functions only asymptote on one side. So this first one, when the base is bigger than one, we call that exponential growth. For the right one, we call that exponential decay. I know I said they both have features of growth and decay, but that's only if you consider yourself moving left, which we don't in general. We think about ourselves moving forward in time, which means we're moving right. So we call this exponential growth because on the right side, we're growing. We call this one decay because on the right side, we're decaying, we're flattening out. Tons and tons and tons of applications for this stuff that you'll see in your science, engineering, or later math classes. Um, one last memo for this, get the blue. The domain and range for these, for both of these, the domain is negative infinity, to infinity. You can go left forever, you can go right forever. There's nothing stopping you. The range, that's the up and down. There's nothing in the negative section. There's also nothing at zero because of the horizontal asymptote. So we start at zero, but we do not include it, so parentheses, and we can go up forever, so zero to infinity. So again, when I ask for a graph or a sketch, or my math lab asks for the same, they might have some transformations, like a plus one or a minus three or a negative to flip things around. Then you just take these pictures and you move them right this much, you move them up this much, uh, you reflect about the x-axis or the y-axis depending on what the transformation says. So let me make sure I have enough space down here. I do, good, okay. So transformations. These are exactly the same as back in chapter two. 
So all horizontal changes are seen inside the core of the function. All vertical changes are seen outside the core of the function. So if you have some b to the x and then a plus c to the side, this would shift up c units. If you had a b to the x and then a minus a c outside of it, that would shift down c units. If you had a b to the x with a plus c in the exponent instead, this would shift it, well, that's inside, so that's left. Remember, the horizontal changes are always backwards. And if you had a b to the x minus c, that would shift it right. Also, for reflections, b to the negative x, since that negative is inside the core, that's a horizontal change, that's a horizontal reflection. In other words, it's about the y-axis, that's the mirror, and a negative b to the x would be a vertical reflection, which means it's about the x-axis. Now, earlier when we had that one half to the x, I related that to two to the negative x for a reason. And if you looked at the graphs comparatively, they're just horizontal reflections of each other. So one half to the x, if it's in parentheses, is the same thing as two to the negative x. One third to the, uh, to the x in parentheses would be negative, I'm sorry, would be three to the negative x. One tenth in parentheses raised to the x would be the same thing as 10 to the negative x. So that's especially demonstrating that horizontal reflection capability there. So let's try this out. For example two, we want to graph, aka sketch, aka just have our basic shape and move it left, right, up, down, and reflect as necessary. So for A, we're going to have y equals 2 to the x, then a plus 3 to the side. Can I pull it down a bit? Uh, I'm going to say, assume you mean up. Scroll up, pull down. I know what you meant. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we did 3.6 back in chapter one. Someone just asked about 3.6. So we did not omit it. We did it back in chapter one because it's really, it really should have been section 1.8, I believe. But the new edition, for some reason, shoehorned it into chapter three, which made no sense. <laughs> so we, we do our own thing for once. So when we have this graph. The first thing I see is this two to the X. So I know that the starting shape is gonna be the one on this left. So we'll have the zero one point, we see growth on the right, we see flattening out on the left. But then there's also this plus three, which says that there is a shift. So the plus three is going to shift it up three because this is a vertical change. So that's going to shift it up three units. So what we'll do, I'm gonna make this kind of small. So here is our zero comma one point, and I'll do this in, let's go with not, not a super heavy color, let's do a light blue. So here's your original graph, and I'll do it kind of dotted. So there's just two to the X. And then what we wanna do is take that graph and shift it up three, and I'll do that in red. Give me, give me my black, thank you, two, three. That's one, two, three. So our actual answer, is that right? Question mark. Because this is what a lot of people would do. They would say that, oh, up three, we just go from the origin of three, but no. This point was at zero comma one. If you shift that up three, it goes to a height of four. So I wanna make sure that we don't make that mistake. So we're gonna go to a height of four. And then we'll have our quick growth on the right and we'll have our decaying on the left. Now, here's what some people will do. They'll say, oh, we're still gonna flatten out to zero, right? That looks a little more awkward. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it is wrong, but not because it looks awkward. 
we have to consider the asymptote as well. So that asymptote was originally y equals zero. This asymptote originally had a height of zero. Asymptotes shift in the same way that points of a graph shift. So if we're shifting all points up three, we have to shift the asymptote up three as well. So going back to that baby blue, again, this right here was our original asymptote, but now we're gonna go up three. Let me just do that again. little better. So that is what this red, our actual answer, is going to conform to. It's what it's going to flatten out to. So there is our graph. And yeah, you can draw this a little more vertically. I just didn't want to write through my equation, but that would make a little better of a picture. So the red is the answer. Let's try another one. And we're going to do f of x equals, let's do a new base. Let's go away from the 2 and the 1 half. Let's do 4 to the x plus 2, where the plus 2 is going to be in the exponent. So b, y equals, and you know what? I'll write it as f of x equals. Remember, they are completely interchangeable for the most part. 4 to the x, and then in the exponent is the plus 2. So pay attention to where the plus or minus the numbers are. So because that plus 2 is, quote, inside the core, as I like to say, instead of outside, the plus 3 is outside, the plus 2 is inside, that's a horizontal shift. So horizontals left or right. Horizontal shifts are backwards, though. It's one of the things we have to keep remembering. So this is a shift of, shift of left 2. Now this four, the base is four, so it's gonna have the same shape as the previous one. It's gonna be exponential growth. So x, y, again in baby blue, I will do the zero comma one with our growth to the right and our flattening out, our decaying away to nothing on the left. So that was just our four to the X. And this was a height of one, but we got to take this everything left two. So left one, two, so negative two, negative one. And if you wanted the horizontal asymptote as well for it, I know it might be confusing since I'm dotting both of them, but I don't want this to be solid and you think it's an answer. Now, if I move this asymptote left, it's not really gonna have any effect because like I said, this thing does extend infinitely. You just don't use the right side of it. So when there's horizontal shifts, that does not affect the asymptote. When there's vertical shifts, it does affect the asymptote. So you need to practice that and understand it. So we're just taking that one singular point that we had at zero comma one and moving it left two. So here's us moving that point left two. Then we will grow to the right try and mimic the ghost image, and then we will flatten out to the left, like that. And its asymptote is the exact same one. That horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. I didn't write it for the last one, but that horizontal asymptote was y equals three. See, the point that you shift originally has a height of one. The asymptotes that you shift originally has a height of zero. They're offset. What a lot of people will think is that they'll have the asymptote the same height as the point, and it's not like that. They are always offset. How are we on time? 30 minutes. I feel like I lost so much time today because of tech issues. All right, let's make sure we got enough room. C. Let's do, let's go back to f of x equals. I could write y, it doesn't matter. And let's go negative three to the x. So because there's a negative in front of our base, that causes a reflection. That is outside the core, so that's a vertical reflection. So there is a vertical reflection, which means it's about 
the y axis, the x axis, excuse me. A vertical reflection top to bottom, that's across the x axis. There's no shifting, there's no plus a number, there's no minus a number in the top or bottom, it's just a reflection. So let's do our, now spoilers, we will need top and bottom of this graph since there's a vertical reflection. So in blue, in baby blue, we'll do the original at a height of one with the growth on the right and the flattening out on the left. It's really hard to do this and dot it. And then we have that horizontal asymptote at y equals zero originally. So this was three to the x. In red, our actual answer we're going to reflect. So the x-axis is our mirror. Well, if this point right here was at a height of one, we're gonna reflect that to a height of negative one. Now, if I say it's gonna do this, that doesn't look like a reflection at all. A reflection means if it was originally going up, this thing is now going to go down. It's still growth, but it's just negative growth. That's kind of crummy looking. Let me try again. That's a little better. And then we have the flattening out on the left, but now we're gonna flatten out from below. A little better. And we have the same horizontal asymptote because it didn't vertically shift. So that horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Very important memo I'm about to say, and this is not really a memo, it's a reminder. Memo, reminder, is, that, is there any difference? Remember, the order matters. If you have a horizontal shift and reflection, you're supposed to do them in a specific order. If you have a vertical shift and reflection, you're supposed to do them in a specific order. Horizontal stuff doesn't affect vertical stuff. That's nice at least. But for reasons that we eh, kind of explained back in chapter two, you have to do horizontal shifts before horizontal reflections. So HS means horizontal shift. Then you have to do horizontal reflections. Those two things have to be done in that order. You also have to do vertical reflections before vertical shifts. Now, again, since the verticals don't interfere with the horizontals, yeah, you could do the vertical stuff uh, before the horizontal stuff if you really, really wanted to. It's just not recommended because I don't want to have to say it 10 different ways. <laughs> If you find a particular order you like that always gets you the right answer, then use your order. This is the order I like that always gets me the right answer. But definitively, horizontal shifts have to be done before horizontal reflections or it's wrong. Vertical reflections have to be done before vertical shifts or it's wrong. The reason those flip-flop is because horizontal shifts are backwards, verticals are not. It has everything to do with that. And the, the reason one is backwards versus the other is because we are actually using uh, a shift notation that advanced mathematics would not use. And the advanced mathematics has all of the, the shifts backwards. You actually put the vertical shift on the same side as the function. It just seems like a very weird thing to do, so we don't do it. <laughs> all right, um, what next, what next? Let's do the natural base E. You know, let me type or you're gonna freak out on me word. We'll go down here, that's fine. What's that comic with the dog and fire all around him? This is fine. The natural base E. This is a number, very similar to pi. It's similar to pi in that it is irrational, meaning it is a decimal value that never terminates and never repeats. In other words, you cannot write this as a fraction and have it be exact. It's also similar to pi in that the number is pretty close to pi. Pi is 3.14, blah, blah, blah. This is 2.7, blah, blah, blah. They're only off by about a half. So this number E is approximately, just round to a few decimal places, 2.71828.
Now in your scientific calculators and your graphing calculators, that looks weird. Oh no. Everything wants to break today. Uh, I'm gonna close that and reopen it. There we go. So if you have a TI-83, you can find that E button right here. There's a little yellow E, so if I hit second and then division symbol, 2.718281828. Now here's what's interesting is it looks like there's a pattern, 1828, You think the next one's 1828 and it's not. That's because this eight's rounded. I think it was a seven. And then it actually changes after that. There's a temporary pattern, but it goes away very quickly. So this does not continue on forever and ever. You can also access it with an exponent already right here down with this LN button, which means log natural or natural log. If you hit second and then that, and then it gives you an, a setup exponent with a parentheses because this is seen so often. So if I wanted E to the first, you get the same number. If I wanted it squared, hit second LN and a two, and there we go. E squared is about 7.3. Um, just some stuff in passing. Hold on. Uh, I feel like that was from before. Uh, some stuff in passing, compound interest. There are two base formulas for this based on whether you're compounding in times per year, which when we talk about our money, this is how our money compounds. Whether you're talking about a savings account that accrues interest maybe quarterly or monthly, or maybe you've got some mutual funds that are accruing interest daily, or maybe you have a savings account that accrues interest daily. It, it varies from bank to bank. They have pretty common techniques, but there is some variation. So we have a formula that A is equal to P, parentheses, one plus R over N, close the parentheses, then you have an exponent of NT. Someone asked a question. The letter N. Compounding N. So N times per year, the N is a number. For instance, if I wanted to compound monthly because there are 12 months in a year, then the value of the letter N would be 12. If I wanted to compound daily, the value of N would be 365. Uh, fun fact, some banks actually use what's called the banker's rule of 360 because it gives you pretty much the same answer. It's, you know, sometimes it'll be off by like a penny. Um, and because they'll just say, oh, there's five holidays in the year, so we don't give you interest those days. It's pretty much negligible, but we don't need to worry about that in here. So what do these letters mean? Uh, what do these letters mean? Yeah, I said that right. A is the future value. how much you have at the end. I guess I don't have to write this out. I can type. So the future value or the ending value. P is the initial value or the principal. R is the interest rate, the annual interest rate. You have to have that as a decimal in the equation. And then T is time typically in years. So this is a finite amount of times compounded, maybe once per year, maybe three times a year, maybe four times a year, maybe 12 times a year, maybe 365 times a year. <clears throat> but there are things in the real world that compound interest, what we call continually. Now, when we're talking money, nothing in the world world compounds continuously with money. Asterisks, maybe something does and I just don't know about it. But generally speaking, when we talk about our money growing or borrowing money, uh, either way, we compound finitely. There's an N. Compounding continuously means, hopefully you can hear this, in the snap of a finger, we have just gained interest 10 quintillion, 10 billion, 10 umpteen million times. But all of those little bits of interest are going to be tiny. The more often you compound, the less you're gaining each compound interval. So if you're gonna gain 10 bucks compounding once a year, if you switch to compounding twice, then the first time you're gonna only gain five bucks. The second time you'd actually gain a little bit more than five bucks, a few more pennies because of the way compounding works. So if you compound continuously, you're gonna get 10 billion, trillion, quintillion, whatever extravagant number you wanna say, 
amounts of interest in the snap of a finger, but they're all going to be fractions of a cent. But at the end of a year, it'll be comparable to the compounding a finite number of times. So what does this look like? It is A equals pert. P, so the same principle, the same future value, but times E, our number, that 2.718, raised to the RT. So everything here, the A, the P, the R, and the T are the same thing. We just don't, we don't have an N anymore. Instead of this one plus R to the N, we have an E. And in calculus, what you do is you show that this quantity, one plus R to the N, sorry, R over N raised to the N, turns into this letter E. There's a fun little proof for that. Your teacher may or may not show it to you, uh, but you can go to the internet. It uses what we call a limit. So these are two mathematical models that can be used to the first one typically used to model money very often the second one you're we're more often going to use to model growth in the real world like a plant growing or cells growing or say a virus spreading maybe because these things are happening continuously not just oh after a day now everybody's infected no i mean every tenth of a second somebody could be getting infected you have to think about it on an infinitely many a compounding scale infinitely many times compounding scale um, 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 um. These are just literally plug and chug. Do I have it up here still? Please tell me I do, yes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put something on the screen for a second. This is a copy of my notes, my handwritten notes that I'm mostly basing this off of. So again, you can pause this in YouTube if you like, if you wanna go back and have a little more in depth with this. So Bob, my favorite person in the world, Bob, he wants to compare two savings accounts. One of these really doesn't exist, the compounding continuously, but we're going to pretend it does. Account A compounds quarterly, which means four times a year he gains money, and that's an interest rate of 3.2%. Account B compounds continuously and has a slightly lower rate of 3%. What the point of this example is trying to see is if that extra 0.2% is enough to overcome compounding continuously, because the more you compound, the more you make. But there's something known as diminishing returns in that the more and more and more you compound, the less and the less and less that you're actually going to add to the pile. You're still adding to the pile, but compounding going from once to twice, maybe you get 10 more bucks in interest. Going from twice to 365, maybe you only gave like five cents in interest. Going from 365 to continuously, maybe it's only, only an extra couple pennies. So that's the idea of diminishing returns. So we're going to put 8,000 bucks away for five years at these two different rates. So account A. Here's our principal of 8,000, just putting it into the formula, which you saw previously, parentheses, one plus, here's our R over, here's our N raised to the N times T. Now you wanna make sure that you multiply out your exponents first with most calculators. So I took the four times the five and made it a 20. Then this one plus 0.032 divided by four raised to the 20 then times 8,000, you can do them systematically through order of operations. Or if you've got a good calculator, you can just let it do all the work for you. So I'll show that typing out. So that's 8,000, parentheses, one plus 0 0.032 divided by four, close the parentheses, caret, which is our exponent, raise it to the 20th power, drum roll, and we get that 9382.11 cents. I rounded to the nearest penny, I think for obvious reasons. Now let's try the continuous account, which is a very different equation. That's the one with the E in it. Same deposit of 8,000, same time in five years, but our interest rate drops a little to 0.03. So we're gonna put that 0.03 times five, which is 0.15, so I can go 8,000. Second E, I can get the regular old E, or since I know I need an exponent, I'll go ahead and pull that one up. And then that's a 0.15. It's actually less work, that's nice. And you get 9294.67. Well, since A was 9300 and B was 9200, you would definitely want the A account, the one that compounded quarterly. Now, the point of this problem was not saying compounding quarterly is better. The point was that just a little bit higher percent rate made it a little better. 
if you compare the same rates in these, let's go back to the first one and do a 3%. So I'm just gonna recall this right here and change the 0 0.32, 0 0.032 to just a 0.3. So now that says 3% and you can see it's $92.89 versus the 92.94. So by compounding continuously, that got us an extra five bucks. Yay, five bucks. Go buy a Chick-fil-A sandwich, right? I mean, hey, at least you get a Chick-fil-A sandwich for that. <laughs> so if the rates are the same, compounding more is better. If the rates are a little different, you'd have to compare them to definitively know. All right, 14 minutes. We can't cut out yet. We need to move on. <clears throat> so that's 4.1. Orm. <laughs> That was the word form from earlier. 4.2, logarithmic functions. This is the first type of function that really makes a lot of people scratch their heads, and I get it. These things operate extremely different than everything else we've dealt with so far, but they have their own set of rules to follow. So as long as we learn those rules, then we can learn to manipulate logarithms. What's the point of a logarithm? What is a logarithm and how do we use it? So let's actually do the what's the point before we get into what it is. The point of a logarithm is, let's say we have the equation two to the x. Let's say we had the equation two to the x is equal to 17 and I asked you to solve for x. What do you do? Well, let's go back to the most basic idea of solving equations. We work in opposite operations, and we've learned a better name for opposite operations, inverse operations. So we're gonna dig up some stuff from chapter two, the very end of chapter two, the idea of inverses. So if you saw an addition, you would subtract. If you saw multiplication, you would divide. If you saw a square root, you would square. If you saw something b squared, you take a plus or minus square root. All those different things were inverses of each other. What is the inverse of having a variable and an exponent? Exactly. It didn't exist at one point. So you know what someone did? They said, I am going to define the function that is its inverse, and then everything that's defined about it is just literally swapping all of the inputs with the outputs, the x's and the y's, which is quite honestly what causes all the different types of calculations with logarithms. All right, so. Because exponential functions are one-to-one, -one, an inverse exists. How do I know they're one-to-one? -one? Go pull up the graphs of them from earlier. Here's the two different types of graphs of exponential functions. They're one-to-one -one because they pass the horizontal line test. You might say, well, if you draw it really, really close to the x-axis, you might hit it more than once because of the flattening out. Nope. They all have different heights. It's flattening out very, 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 very slowly, but it is always going to have a different height to the left and the right of each point. You might say, what about, at X, what about at a height of zero? Well, there is no graph at a height of zero because of the asymptote. So these pass the horizontal line test, meaning that they're one-to-one, -one, meaning that an inverse exists. And some mathematician dude decided to say, hey, let's call the inverse of this a logarithm. That is the entire idea, that logarithms are the inverse of exponentials. So. The function f of x equals log base b of x. Notice I wrote that b a little lower and it's not because of my crummy handwriting or an inability with this drawing tablet. I wrote the b a little lower and it should be a teeny bit smaller. This is the inverse of f of x equals b to the x. Those two things are inverses of each other. In other words, everything about them swaps inputs and outputs. So if I graphed the b to the x, say two to the x, if I then swapped every x and y coordinate, I would get the graph of log base two of x. 
So because in the exponential form, I'm holding my pen upside down, because in the exponential form we call the base B, in the logarithmic form, this little number right here, we also call it base B. So this is saying what the base would be if you switched formats or if you did its inverse. Now, quite honestly, we don't focus too much on going from one to the other in terms of inverting them. We just focus on what they are, one format versus the other, not by inverting them, just equivalent expressions. So again, the thing I'm about to write, these are not inverses, these are equivalents. One in a logarithmic form, one in an exponential form. So to convert between logs and exponentials, y equals log base b of x. This is the same thing as, and it goes either way, that's a double-sided arrow saying you can go one way or the other, b raised to the y is equal to x. This is extremely important. This gets used hundreds of times in this chapter if we were able to complete it. So some students like bland memorization of formats, and that's fine. What I like to do is I like to say that the base in one format is the base in the other format. So the base in one is the same as the other. So the base of the exponential is the little base of the logarithm. Also, the number by itself in one and by when I say in one, I mean one format, is not by itself in the other. That's the only two things I use to convert from one to the other. I've seen people draw these little uh, uh, John Madden looking diagrams of this a circle and then pointing to this thing and flip-flopping over there and all sorts of weird things. And that's fine. If that works for those teachers and students, that's fine. But I like this. The base is the base is the base. You just have to understand where the base goes. In an exponential, the base is under the exponent. In a logarithm, it's a little lower between the log and the inside of the log. And then in one thing, the number, and it doesn't have to be the number, I should say the thing. So the number or variable. Let me just insert a little memo there. Uh-oh. Oh, <sighs> okay, good. <laughs> no, uh-oh, we're good. I got worried for a second, it was freezing. Uh, the number or variable, and then it would not be the same as the other. Okay, good. So let's try this out. Let's try converting from one to the other. What do we have to example one? Convert. I'm not even going to say convert to exponential. I'm not going to say convert to logarithm. I'm just going to say convert. So for A, we'll have two equals log base five of X. Now I say log base five of X. You could also say log of X base five, but you, if you're saying these things, you have to say both of those details. I can't just say log of X. Can't just say log base five. I have to say both of those details. The base is five, and we're taking the log of x. So changing forms. So this little double arrow is me saying we're changing the forms. So we are in the logarithmic form, which means we got to switch to the exponential form. So the base in this form should be the base in the other form. This is the base, this five. So when I write a five, it should have an exponent on it. I'm not saying the exponent zero, I'm saying I'm gonna write something here. What is the exponent? Okay, well, they'll be in equals, so there'll be an exponent here. Again, I'm not gonna leave that there, I'm just making sure. And then there'll be something on the right-hand side. It's gonna be five to the something equals something else. How do I know which of the two and the x goes in the exponent? based on the fact that the thing that was by itself in one version can't be by itself in the other version. The two was by itself in this version, which means I cannot put the two here. So that means the two goes here. So 
our x must go on the side by itself. So the base raised to the exponent equals the inside of the log. The base raised to the exponent, that's the other thing, equals the inside of the log. The thing that's by itself in one version is not by itself in the other. That's not enough to say everything though, because you still have to know that the base is the base. Now note that that says 25 equals x, because we can do five squared, but the answer is just the five squared. Hold on a second. Okay, so that was not what I asked. I didn't ask you to solve, I asked you to convert. So it, this is fine, but this is the conversion. You have to make sure that you're careful with the instructions um, because my math lab will probably mark it wrong if you were at 25 equals X. Uh, B, our next one, three equals log base B of 64. All right, so, sorry, I got someone talking in my background. I don't know if y'all can hear that or not. <laughs> um, the base in one is the base in the other. So we're given the logarithmic form. We got to switch to exponential. So let's switch forms. So the base in the logarithmic form is that B. So there's going to be something up and to the right of the B, and then we'll have the equals and something on the other side. And it doesn't matter which side's which, as long as the information is all together. So that's the base. The exponent will be on the left side written this way. Now, the thing that was by itself before can't be by itself again. The three was by itself here, so I can't have the three on the right, which means that's the exponent. And that means the 64 is what goes by itself. And again, that's the conversion. That's the answer. <clears throat> but what some people might realize is that, hey, I can figure out what B is because I know the cube root of 64. You could take the cube root of this on both sides and actually solve for b and know that b is 4. And this will be important later, but for now we're just converting. In fact, equation a, we solved for x. So we have managed to solve both of these things, which were numbers we have no idea what they mean, quite honestly. I, most math teachers can't even really tell you a lot of what these are most of the times until they're in exponential format. All right, c, log base 3 of 13 is equal to y. And this will be the last one because we only have a couple minutes. Uh, we'll do the other conversions next time. So the base is the base in one format versus the other. The base is a three. So it'll be three to the something equals something else. So the three will have the exponent. All right, whatever was by itself before can't be by itself again. Y was by itself. So we can't have the y over here. That has to be the exponent, meaning that the 13 is by itself. Now in A and B, we're able to figure out what the unknown quantity is just by some normal math, some solving of equations we've done before. This, we can't. Three to the y equals 13 was actually the type of equation that I said was the whole reason we have logarithms to begin with. In fact, in terms of a solution, C was solved in the beginning. The log base three of 13, this is just a number that our calculators can find. It actually can't find it without a trick, and I will teach you that trick if we have time. But that says y equals, so y equals a number. This is a solution. Converting it to exponential form just might give us a better idea of how it computes or something like that. But it's interesting that A and B, when you change them, it gives us something that's solvable, but C doesn't. That's because some equations are solvable in one format and some are solvable in the other format. And it's usually whatever we have is not what we want, usually. All right, so we will call it a day there. We have finished chapter three. Your review materials for chapter three are available. Your test There we go. Remember, our test is going to be available starting Thursday at 12.01 a.m. and it'll be due Monday the 4th by 11.59 p.m. Please I think I said a review was available already. I'm sorry. Yes, the review is available. The test will be available Thursday. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. Uh, 
so Thursday the 30th to Monday the 4th, and then we're going pretty much straight into the final. We'll still have class Tuesday. We're still going to introduce some new stuff in chapter four. We need to use every second we can. Your review for the final should be prepared by then, and then the final will be Thursday, May 7th, one day only, so make sure you have some time dedicated for that. If for some reason, you have some crazy extenuating circumstance that says you will not be able to take the test that day, you need to let me know in advance because I have to have all grades in Friday. Have a good one. Email me if you have any questions. I am so sorry for all the technological issues today, uh, and we'll see you next class. This, this video should be up in about 30 minutes on YouTube. Hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers that uh, the glitches didn't give me another issue.